Hi, my name is Miriam Lauba, and I am the senior producer of the Play On Podcasts. One of the benefits of this job has been the opportunity to work with some artists I have admired from afar. Eric Ting is one such artist. Eric is the director of our Play On podcast of King Lear. He is an Obie Award-winning director whose work and mission lives at the intersection of art and community practice. He has served as the artistic director of Cal Shakes since 2016, which is San Francisco's largest theater with Shakespeare and the classics as part of its central mission. Alongside his commitment to Shakespeare, Eric has remained deeply committed to the development of new and diverse voices for the American theater and has directed many of their works, including the plays of some of the playwrights in the Play On family, like Marcus Gardley, Lloyd Suh, and Aditi Kapil. Additionally, Eric's work has also been seen internationally in Singapore, France, the United Arab Emirates, Holland, Hungary, and Bali, but we are lucky enough to have him with us today. And personally, I will add, it was a gift to witness his work on Marcus Gardley's translation of one of Shakespeare's greatest tragedies. Eric, welcome to the Play On Podcast bonus (laughs) content series for King Lear. (laughs) Thank you, Miriam. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. I I have to like edit my bio down to two sentences for... (laughs) <laughs> no, you. we want the no. whole thing. It's a great, it's a fascinating bio, actually. Um, and I'm going to ask you a little bit about that, but I'm going to start at the very beginning, Eric. Where yeah. were you born? Where were you born? Oh, oh my goodness. Oh, is, this is that kind of interview. Uh, you know, I was, uh, um, I was actually born in Grand Forks, North Dakota. Oh. Um, yeah, I know. It's a strange one. And then I was, but then I lived there for a few years before our family moved to Morgantown, West Virginia which is where I largely was raised. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about um, your parents and your upbringing and what brought you to West Virginia? Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, I think uh, both both my mother and my father were uh, first generation immigrants to this country. So they came from um, different parts of China. My mother came through the southern part of China through and through Hong Kong. And they actually... Uh, my mother's story is that her mother, my grandmother, met uh, a Mormon missionary in Hong Kong and converted to the Mormon faith. Wow. And then basically found a family to sponsor their coming to the U.S. And so they arrived in the U.S. in Utah on a mink farm. Oh, my goodness. And that's how they came to the U.S. Uh, my mother was, I think, just in uh, just starting high school at the time. And then my father... Um, came over, uh, his family had moved to Taiwan by the time that he came to the U.S. and he came over as a grad student and they met in college at Penn State. Oh. Um, and my father was a, a, a rock photographer. A rock photographer? A rock photographer. So not music, but actually stone. So, <laughs> so, so it's not as exciting as it sounds. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And uh, he, he was a geologist, and so, oh, okay. um, but that was his specialty, and so that's how we ended up in North Dakota. He was teaching at the university there in Grand Forks. Um, I think his claim to fame in North Dakota was he discovered a vein of coal. Wow, um, okay. <laughs> and it was that work that took us to West Virginia, because obviously the coal industry coal country. there. And, um, and he, he taught there at the university in Morgantown. Were either of your parents... Uh... Uh, involved in the arts or had uh, inclinations toward the arts? Not at all. I mean, not at all. I mean, I think my father sort of followed the kind of straight line of expectations around children in a Chinese American family. And, you know, um, I was expected to be an engineer or an Uh architect or a doctor. Uh, And my mother, though, I will say, uh, came to art fairly uh, a little later in her life. And, um, and I like to think she likes to tell me that I was, or she used to tell me that I was the reason that she came to art because when I was a little kid, um, and my sister was born, I was four years old. My sister was born in a hospital in Morgantown. My father bought me a comic book (laughs) and it was like Ms. Marvel number one. It's something random, but, um, but I sort of fell in love with comic books back then. And I always wanted to learn how to draw them. And so I would make my mom sit at the dining room table with me and sh- like help me like I force her to help me figure out how to draw things like fists and like ah. you know and she sort of really couldn't and so eventually she 
uh, found an art teacher for me. And in the process, she found an art teacher for her and she became a potter. Wow. Um, and so she was, uh, while she was running a Chinese restaurant um, for her day job, she would go home and she would throw pots on this little electric wheel and, and fire them in her little electric kiln down in our basement. And, I love that. There was an electric kiln in your basement and your mom did come to it through you. She really did come to it through you. So um, it's interesting to me that you um, started with the uh, physical uh, arts. Do you still draw, Eric? I do. Yes, ah. absolutely. I mean, not as much as I used to. And I will say like when I was younger, sort of through high school and into college, I was actually like I was a professional artist. So I would have gallery shows. Um, oh my goodness, and, I had no idea. Yeah, I, I know. It's not a thing that I tell people very much about. Um, I don't do it anymore. I will say I don't do that anymore. I think I found that um, like the art that I tended, the, the art that I did, which was sort of like these really densely illustrated images mm -hmm. um, uh, would take sometimes, you know, a year to complete and would be oftentimes a record of my life during uh -huh. the period of time that I was working on it. So the practice of selling that work felt like the practice of selling bits of me and parts of me. And it just felt, it didn't feel, I didn't feel, it didn't feel right with me. And I finally just sort of like, was like, I, I need to pull away from this. Um, uh, or I would like lose these memories because I think they became memories for me in their way. They became kind of like containers of memory for me. Um, what and so I, I left that behind. I still, I draw, but these days I draw for my daughter. <laughs> I draw, oh. I draw Pokemon characters for her to color. <laughs> <laughs> I love the description of a physical piece of art as a, as a container of memories. Yeah. Um, how did that influence uh, you wanting to become a director? Um, I fell into theater kind of unexpectedly. I was, um, you know, my father's influence was, was heavy. And, 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 and for good reason. I mean, I, I loved him. I didn't know him as well as I wish I did. He passed away when I was a junior in high school. Um, and, uh, but the influence was there and sort of the general familial expectation. It's a thing that it's a thing that I think some, some folks will, will find very familiar, but, um, yes. uh, but when we, when I was in college, I, w I went to an undergrad, I sort of stayed home in Morgantown. I went to WVU, West Virginia University, uh, in part because when my father passed, I, I wanted to stay and help my mother with her restaurant. Um, so it made sense for me to kind of like stay at home and, and, um, and to study at home. And I was in, uh, I was on a liberal arts degree track, um, but to like, but in biology with, the, <laughs> you know, to become a doctor, it was all of these yes, things. And, yes, and like, yes. and I was all set to do that. And then my last year in college, I had like these, like one course, one required course left to take in order to graduate, but I had a scholarship. So I had to fill the rest of my um, sort of like curriculum for each semester yes. with classes that I didn't really have to take. And so I committed to taking classes that were essentially the last classes I would ever consider taking. Oh. Um, and so they included a bunch of things, like they included like the, the random history classes. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the classes that I took that first semester was a class in puppetry. And at the time, WVU was one of only two universities in this country that had an undergraduate puppetry program, the other university being the University of Connecticut at Stores. Wow. Um, but, but West Virginia University, Joanne Segrist, uh, sort of took me under her wing and was like, you know, so excited to have somebody, I think, come in who had kind of this sort of really interesting background um, and allowed me... Uh, essentially free reign to create the kinds of work that I wanted to create. And then in the process, she started introducing, getting me into classes in, in design, in lighting design and set design and costume design. And so I was moving into design and I was like on this fast track. And then the, the, the head of the directing program there kind of got to know me and was like, Hey, you should actually be a director. Come join us over here. Um, and then like, and, and, and the kind of rest was just history sort of, I, I, I got into theater I, I fell into it in a way. Um, you know how it is like when you, when there's a, a kind of vacuum in your life and all of a yes. sudden something comes in to fill it and you didn't yes. realize there was a vacuum there until that moment in time. And theater was kind of like that for me. Yes. And then I, I guess my question would be, how, why did you immediately, because I would assume coming from the visual arts that the design that you would feel 
the vacuum would be fulfilled in design, but actually it was yeah. directing. So what was it about directing that yeah. satisfied that uh, need or desire? So, so the vacuum that I was describing was actually, it wasn't a vacuum about like art so much as it was a vacuum about people oh, and relationship. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. like, you know, and I think that um, growing up a, a, a sort of a young, a young Chinese American boy in a family of immigrants, um, you know, like my particular experience, which I think is a shared experience because I, I know enough friends and um, colleagues who have shared similar stories, um, was that there wasn't a lot of physical affection in growing up in my family, you know, like mm -hmm. physical, like love was shown in many ways, yes, but not in a way that was like about physical displays of it. Yes. Um, you know, it was shown in our food or it was shown right. in like the sort of expectations of like X, Y, or Z, but like, but it wasn't like you just didn't, there wasn't a lot of intimacy and vulnerability present growing up. And so what happened when I got into puppetry was like puppetry was like an obvious place for me because I'm by nature a megalomaniac. So I like, I like having control <laughs> over lots of different things. And, and really the practice of my last 10 years has been about learning how to let go of control. Uh, interesting. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, but that back then I was like, yes, let me, let me do it all because I didn't need anyone. And, um, and I think what I learned fairly swiftly was that I needed everyone. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that the, the pleasure of being in a practice that was for me, at least fundamentally about collaboration and about the kind of union of ideas um, felt so sort of um, liberating. Uh, and, um, and so that was the vacuum that I found when I got into the theater was like, oh, no, 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 no. Like, like, sure, you could make these things on your own and by yourself, but, but you could make these things with lots of people. And, you know, and you could like wade into the kind of complexity of that right and like and and you could learn how to how to how to not just move people in the direction that you're moving but you could also learn how to move in the direction of other people yes. and that was the thing that I think I hadn't encountered too much in my life until that mo moment in time like what does it mean to give give over yes which is why you describe your art as the intersection of community working in community always yeah. the give and take I mean of, yeah Exactly. I mean, the community practice component of it really didn't pick up until I got to, to the California Shakespeare Theater, where I've been artistic director for about six years now. And um, and before that, you know, it had it had been part of my life, but it hadn't been a, a core part of my practice. Um, and it's become a core part of my practice in the last five, six years um, in many ways, I think, because that theater changed me um, and invited me to uh, uh, to rethink sort of how we make this art that we make. Um, but yes, I would say like, there's like, you could definitely f follow a thread. Yes. Right. Yes. The, the, the desire from, from making art on your own and feeling the, uh, the vulnerability and the uh, vacuum of that um, to moving into making it, into community, but also through, in some ways, a design lens, through the lens of an overall uh, picture, it sounds like. Um, yeah, I mean, I think like, I think in any collaboration, people bring their individual skills and, 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 and points of view, right? And so like, I definitely think like, for me, I have, you know, there's, there, there, you know, I have, I have my strengths, I have my weaknesses, certainly, but like, um, I like to think that, uh, what I bring to a process is a, a kind of sense of a whole. Like I'm, I'm always very good at kind of like understanding what the whole is. And, um, and sometimes that means making choices that don't make sense in that particular moment, but right. like reveal themselves by the time you get to the end of it. Um, I also do tend to think sometimes that like sort of the visual sort of my, like, which is why podcasts are so yes, strange for me. Gonna, there's like nothing visual about it, but, um, <laughs> but like, but you know, in the theater on the, on the stage, it's like yes. the visual component of it is huge for me. Um, it's been, it's been one of the strange things about directing in a pandemic is that like, you know, because I am by nature a visual person, 
do you know when you're in rehearsals and most people who are in rehearsals in person, you're wearing masks for the vast majority yes. of it. I just got finished with the process. And, um, and I don't think I saw, like I was missing 50% of every actor's face until, oh. you know, until literally the, the last day of tech. Oh, right. Oh gosh. That's so, so such a different world. <laughs> I'm going to go back to Shakespeare, but since you brought this up, let's talk about uh -huh. what's the difference between working um, on a, a play on stage and working on it in a podcast. Oh my, my gosh. I mean, like, I mean, you know, some of it is like process and time. Like, you know, you don't, you don't rehearse. I mean, at least, at least for our process here, we don't, we, we don't rehearse in the same way that we rehearse a play, right? There's like, there's less time, but there's also, um, it's kind of like, but what starts to happen is, is that you don't, you're, you're focused on, so the casting is like so much of the work, right? So you mm. bring the right people together. And what you find very quickly is when you have the right people in the room, they crack open a work um, in a million different rich and subtle ways. And, um, and that's true across both medium, right? It doesn't like if you're, if you're doing in person, like, like theater um, in four dimensions, or you're doing a podcast, which is its own different kind of form. Um, I guess what I would say was sort of really different for me was um Different and not different, I should say, because I, I will say this, like, and this is maybe connects us, I'm going to connect us to Shakespeare, if that's all okay. right, yeah, yeah, please. Miriam, which is like, you know, there's a thing about Shakespeare mm -hmm. that is unlike a lot of other theater that we do, right, which is that Shakespeare, Shakespeare was written to be listened to, right, so yeah. Shakespeare, so like, you know, this is like, there's like, there's that, that old apocryphal kind of thing that we say a lot, those of us that worked in Shakespeare, which is back in the Elizabethan days, you know, audiences went to listen to the theater, right. whereas today we go to see the theater. <laughs> um, and this notion of listening to the theater was, I think, you know, you see that reflected in the work itself, because, um, because the way that Shakespeare is writing, Shakespeare is writing, at least, is like with a sense of rhythm um, and meter and um, exposition and poetry that it contains everything in and of itself. Do you know, like yes. it's the story of it, the, you know, the narrative of it survives sort of interpretation after interpretation after interpretation in part because in many ways, Shakespeare delivers everything that you need to understand the story in the text itself. Yeah. And, um, and so in that sense, right, what starts to happen is, is if you're directing Shakespeare on stage, right, you know, and you're really kind of leaning into and committing to that kind of idea of it, um, you know, the, the, the visuals are simply, um, they're, they're things that sit, uh, that hang upon the text. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and in a way, what starts to happen is, is that, uh, for me, at least, as I was, as we were working on this, I, it felt, it came, became clear to me that the podcasts operate in a similar way, right? Like, you just, like the information is, if you can trust in the text, the information is provided in the text itself. And Marcus um, is, uh, you know, we say all, like uh, Marcus is a 21st century griot, but yes. also yes. like like from our perspective at Cal Shakes, um, you know, I, I I think of this of Marcus all the time, which is like Marcus is um, as much as anyone else I know, a living embodiment of um, what Shakespeare was when Shakespeare was writing. Oh, today. that's a great way to describe him. Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about that? What your relationship with Marcus has been before this piece and um, how you've come to know that about Marcus? Yeah, you know, I, Marcus and I were both in New Haven around the same time when Marcus was studying at Yale and I was working at Long Wharf Theater, um, initially as an artistic associate, eventually as associate AD there. Um, and I encountered his work uh, quite a bit while he was there. Um, but we didn't really get to know each other really well until we produced his play Black Odyssey at Cal Shakes, I guess now four or five years ago. Um, it was not the world premiere, but it was the second production, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, and when Cal Shakes committed to producing it, one of the reasons that we wanted to do it was because Marcus in many ways hails from Oakland mm -hmm. and um, from the Bay Area, right? And we were like, hey, Marcus, we're, we're, we're really wanting to focus on like writers who have Bay Area roots um, we want to bring new writers in to sort of like reimagine classics. Your play Black Odyssey is a perfect example of what we want to do. 
um, will you help us kind of launch this initiative? And Marcus was like, yeah, I'll totally do it on one condition. And I was like, okay, what's that? And it would actually turn out to be two conditions. One was I needed to hire, um, I needed to hire uh, Linda Tillery and Molly, Molly, Molly Holmes to be, to sort of create the music for this oh. production, um, uh, who were two, um, who are two extraordinary artists uh, that Marcus had worked with in the past and just really felt so important to it. Um, and then the second one was that he was going to rewrite the play to set it in Oakland. And I was like, oh my God. And what started to happen was um, with that in experience, you know, what we, what I, what, what I learned from Marcus was that, um, you know, classic like narratives that have like timeless narratives, narratives that have stood the test of time, do you know, also stand um, the test of reinvention mm. and reimagination, uh -huh. and um, and so in the best of ways, right? What you find is you find you find stories that have seeped into our collective unconscious, mm -hmm. right? These are narratives, um, you know, the Odyssey, King Lear, you know, these are these are narratives that like we know whether or not we know them, um, because they show up over and over and over again in so many different shapes and forms. Like, so succession is a really good example of another form of <laughs> That's right. out there in the yes. world. And like, and yes. you just know it and you just recognize yeah. it and you're like, okay, yeah, this is a thing. And, and like, and what you often recognize in it is a sense of the human condition that, um, that has repeated itself generation after generation across culture, um, across belief systems, across yeah. all the different things that we think of that divide us. There are things that connect us and, uh, and so that was like, that was one of the great lessons of working with Marcus on Black Odyssey was, and then also just to, just to see someone with such immense facility with language, mm -hmm. um, sort of come in and, um, and, and, and I would say, I should say about Marcus, and this is why I think like, like we do think of, I, I do think of him as a griot, right? Like he's, so he, he, he often in his work has kind of source material that anchors his stories, his plays. Um, but you know, what he's able to do as a, as a, as a kind of wordsmith is, is he's able to, um, um, he's able to reinvent the text in a way that is both timeless and timely. And that's the thing that I really love about Marcus is like Marcus, Marcus is, um, a kind of, he, he channels. Yes right? The world as we are wrestling with it in the moment into work that like, that maybe has nothing to do with the moment that we're living in, but at the same time has everything to do with the time that we're living in. And Marcus allows us to see it in that way. And how do you think his production, his, I'm sorry, his translation of King Lear uh, does that? How is it wrestling with what we are... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think like, so, you know, I, I, I do think I probably need to admit to something, right? I need to admit <laughs> on this podcast that like when I first heard about the play on initiative and sorry, Louie, sorry, I'm really sorry, everyone who did like, who have done such amazing work on this, but like I was running a freaking Shakespeare theater and I had audiences right. who were like, what do you think about this thing that they're doing up at OSF? Because they're like translating and they're like, and people were like in a huff about it. Well, like, and like, they're just so angry, yes. which I'm sure like you all yes. know, but but like, yeah. I was like, I was like, well, you know, I mean, uh, I, what I was saying at the time was I, I had my doubts. Right. I had my doubts in part because I, I, I definitely belong in the school of thought, which is sort of like, I, I mean, I love Shakespeare. I, I don't think Shakespeare needs to be translated. It doesn't need to be translated. Like, I think there's a lot of other issues that we can look at with Shakespeare that are about kind of reclaiming it or decentering it, or like, like there's a, a hundred different ways to talk about it. But at the time I was like, I don't know that I need amazing playwrights whose work I love to be right. spending a year translating a play when they could be creating new plays. It's like, I was like, I would, you know, I, I would, I would much rather like read all the plays that they would be writing in this time. Um, and that was, what I was thinking, I just, you right. know, I, I, like, so I'm admitting to this. Um, and what I would say to people is like, I have my doubts about it, but I will say that what I'm most, most acutely interested in 
is the play that they write after this. Well, this is the thing, Eric, I have to tell you, because of course I spent, you know, we were there at OSF. We were working yes. on these translations. And this is the thing that Louis always said that I thought was right. And the playwrights, when, when they started working on them, what they said is, oh my goodness, I never get to be in the room with Shakespeare because I'm a playwright. So why would yes. I be in the room? But I get to be in the room with Shakespeare for uh, for uh, for a year, and yes. it enriched my writing uh, yes. so much. So so yes, it's like what happens after a playwright has spent a year with uh, King Lear? What exactly. happens? Yeah, exactly. And also like, and the idea is like, and the idea right is because I've seen, I know a few playwrights who have gone on to do this right, which is like, so you do your translation, which is like the literal translation of it, and and I think I think as I understand it, different playwrights like come at that yes from different perspectives around like yes. how much liberty one takes with the text and so on and so forth um but i am aware of at least some playwrights who have like gone on to write plays that are clearly inspired by the work that they did with play on but um are are complete inventions in the most i think delicious ways and i think um and i guess uh and i guess that's that's all great and i i guess what i will say though is now that i've been working on one now that i've had the opportunity yes, to work on one right <laughs> and full disclosure cal shakes is producing not full disclosure. Um, That's a great. We should. We should full disclosure. Oh, yeah. Let's yeah. let's make it a, 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 yeah. a, a, a <laughs> what is it? A, 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 an ad for it. You yeah. are doing uh, Marcus Gardley's King Lear in your upcoming. We are doing season, yes. yes. Okay. We are doing Marcus Gardley's Lear. He's. he's it's <laughs> yes. called Lear. Yes. And, um. And yeah, absolutely. We're we're producing it. I'm co-directing it with Don Monique Williams. Ooh. Um. And we're going to be doing it at Cal Shakes this fall. And, um, and, you know, so, so when, when you all reached out to me about working on this podcast, I was like, yes, please, I, I have to, because I know six months from now, I'm going to be directing a company of actors in this. And the more opportunity I can have to kind of get to know sort of like what this is, right? What, what, what Shakespeare in translation is, number one, how Marcus is meeting the story of King Lear, number two. Um, and just kind of like in, immersing myself in the play on world. I mean, I couldn't say no to it. And so it's been such a gift. Um, and yeah, and I would just say like, you know, we, I think, I think Cal Shakes is producing it, is producing it because of our association with Marcus and, and, and how much every single person that has anything to do with Cal Shakes loves Marcus and, and, mm -hmm. and the way within which Marcus and, and his work has touched so many of our lives. Um, we're also doing it because of kind of what I was saying earlier, right? Like, I think like we've been, we as an organization have been wrestling with what it means to be a Shakespeare theater producing in a time of sort of, um, at a time when our society is, is really reflecting upon, right? Structural inequities, um, that have created a world that I think many of us, resist and want to resist and um and want to transform um into something better and so you know uh, from our point of view when we think about what place shakespeare has in our cultural conversation in this moment in time um something like what Marcus is doing with King Lear and what so many of the playwrights are doing with the canon through play on, um, including the awesome writers that you mentioned earlier, yeah. Lloyd and Aditi, I love, love, love. Um, you know, I think that uh, what, what we're finding there is sort of like an understanding that, you know, I mean, that is the thing I always wish people, I want people to think about, right. Which is like, no one is talking about, like excising Shakespeare. No one is talking about removing Shakespeare from the cultural dialogue. If anything, what we're trying to do is we're trying to kind of explore how we can be um, in communion with and not simply servant to. Yes. And that's the thing that I think is like very compelling to me in the process of, of this work is that like, you know, I think for many, for many artists and for many audiences, um, Shakespeare is something to be served, 
right? Like, like Shakespeare is put on this pedestal and there's like a kind of like, there are purists who right, right. kind of approach the canon with a, a very specific point of view. Um, but I would just say like, I, 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 I was just saying this the other day in a staff meeting, right? That there's, um, there's a reason why these plays have endured mm-hmm. and they've not endured because they've been produced exactly the same way that they were produced yeah. the very first right. time they were no. produced. They've endured because they have been produced and reinterpreted over and over and over again through so many different lenses um, and have persisted. Right. And so from, from my perspective, you know, what we're trying to do is simply a, a, another evolution of this work. It, it's another piece of this extraordinary puzzle that is, um, you know, this canon of 37 plays, however many plays and like, um, and, uh, and, and like, oh my God, you know, to be able to see that and understand that from a high level and to look at this, the role that this work is playing in that giant picture, right. Is I think really amazing. And, um, and to, and I think what's different here about the play on initiative is that for a long time, we relied on directors to bring this kind of point of view to this work, Mm -hmm. right? That for a long time, directors were the ones who were like, oh, I want to set this play in this time period because I'm noticing or recognizing these conditions within this story that feel evocative of this moment in time in human history. And that like, we're going to make this connection through our production so that people can understand how these stories continue to speak to the human condition um, and, um, and what's happening now is by putting writers into this role, right. What we're getting is just like, you know, anyone who's worked in new plays such as I have, right. Understands kind of like, you know, writers are the ones that are the chroniclers of the moment, you know, mm-hmm. the rest of us are all interpreters. Right. <laughs> That's a great way to describe it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and the writer is the one who's actually trying to capture, uh, a sense of, of the moment and to, to wrestle it into some kind of shape. Um, and, and, and for many of us, it's the kind of great catalyst for the work that we do. And I feel that way about this process. Um, and I, I, what's really amazing about it is that now, like what we're finding is, is that, you know, Shakespeare becomes just one part of a whole as opposed to the whole. And that feels like a um, compelling and generous way to approach this writer, this canon um, in this moment. That's really beautiful, Lily said. You've been listening to the Play On Podcast bonus content series. You can learn more about the Play On Podcasts at Next Chapter Podcasts website, ncpodcast.com. That's N as in next, C as in chapter, podcasts with an S at the end, dot com. Where you can find other Play On Podcast series and interviews, along with talk podcasts like The 500, The 10, the Tough Juice podcast with Karen Butler, and a whole lot more. I'd like to thank Jeremiah Tittle, the founder of Next Chapter Podcasts, and my producer, Peter Musto. Our audio engineer is Adam Bernard, and our editor and sound designer is Justin Cortez. Be sure to subscribe to Next Chapter Podcasts for updates on all the latest content, and don't forget to rate and review our shows. I'm Miriam Lauba, and I look forward to sharing more incredible works in the Play On podcast series with you, along with lots of enlightening bonus content at Next Chapter Podcasts. 